Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by Chloe Mistagi, who is a security activist, security practitioner. Um, Any other words you'd like to use to describe yourself there, Chloe? I guess just advocate usually is the thing that I do. (laughs) Very good, an advocate. And we've got a couple of different topics to to talk through with Chloe. Um, I thought we might start with... uh, the representation of security researchers sort of in the media or in the industry, because I think that's a, a topic of, of interest and one that you've spoken on. So why don't we start with what does the media get wrong in its representation of security researchers? Right. Well, it, in general, what we've seen in the media is that they confuse the two parties of an attacker versus a hacker. And for those that do not know the difference is the hacker is there to try to prevent such instances that attackers do. Um, In other words, the intent is very different. They use the exact same skill set to find vulnerabilities. The only difference is one does not exploit them um, for their own gain. So, for example, a hacker is someone who's going to report the vulnerability um, and would never exploit the vulnerability Um, without permission. Now, the attacker, on the other hand, uh, finds the vulnerability, uses that vulnerability to for their own gains. So the intent is different. And the thing is, is that most of the media does not know that there's two of these separate parties, uh, because usually when they report about any situations of like a breach, malware, ransomware, they use the term hacker instead of an attacker. And this is just has been an ongoing situation, right? Because the public perception of the hacker community is that we are criminals. And so it's something that we're trying to change um, because these socially constructed beliefs, things that we have read, we have seen in movies, we've um, heard from friends, families and whatnot, is the belief that hackers are the same as attackers. And so the media is not quite aware that there's two separate groups. And so it's important for us to try to change that mindset because it's this mindset that um, the imagery and the language that is used to portray the hacker community in a negative light that prevents us from having any rights or even to update really out of date legislation. So you're, you're drawing a connection there between that, that representation and, and actually the ability to, to accomplish things, which I think is important. I don't want to lose sight of that. But, um, you know, we've used the term the media here, and I just want to pull at that a little bit. Where does this representation occur? Because of course, the the media isn't isn't one thing. Um, Good question. So media, for those that aren't aware, is media consists of press, marketing, and social media. So all of that forms into, quote unquote, the media. So uh, anytime there's an imagery of a hacker wearing a hoodie in a basement, sometimes with a ski mask on. This is a type of imagery that basically connects uh, a public person to think that that person is a criminal because criminals dress like that, right? And so that that's one of the things. Also using um, the wrong terminology for the, the responsible party for causing the abuse. Um, that is another thing that we need to address. So the the press is a an area that I think we we can all sort of intuitively understand, right? You've got you know news articles, opinion pieces written about the industry. Um, some of those are written from you know sort of an industry perspective inside the industry, uh, information security industry, and some of them are are more general public uh, pieces. You know, you might find in USA Today. Is there is do you see a difference in how the two sort of tiers of press handle the the term hacker versus criminal or attacker? I think the whole thing is that a lot of them are not aware of the difference. Um, just like how we are, we're, I mean, humans, we don't know everything, right? Um, but when someone points out, like, actually, the correct term is to use this, we remember that. 
Um, and so I think it's important is to work with um, the press and that when we provide comments about the hacker community that we use the right terminology and we also let them know why we're using this terminology for them to be aware of. Um, after talking with press outlets, it's what I always do to make sure the editor is aware of it. And most of the time they actually honestly did not know that there was a difference. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with we start learning more about the world that we live in when we get outside of our bubble um, in a sense that I don't think a lot of people have met hackers. And because they've never met a hacker in their life, they have these beliefs, these stereotypes that are very much real to them. Um, and I think that's that's the issue that we're facing right now is challenging these socially constructed beliefs of what is a hacker. That's interesting, because, of course, if, if they had met a hacker, they they also might not choose to use that label for them because of the pejorative implications that they've learned. Yeah. So the the why it matters, I think, is important because, you know, there's a, a certainly a, a viewpoint that someone could take that, you know, this is, it's just a word. Why not, why do you need to use the word hacker? Why not just change your language and adopt something like security researcher instead and let the press equate, uh, you know, hacker with criminal and, and be done with it that way. Why does it matter? I, I get this question quite a bit. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that when we say hacker, we're also referring to so like um, security researcher or ethical security researcher or ethical hacker. These are all terms that mean exactly the same thing. Um, the thing is, is that the reality of it is that many of us that went into this field we like the term hacker because that's what we do. A hacker is someone who uses hacking. It's not just a mindset. It's it's also a part of life. And so when we are saying hacker, it's a way of identifying as who we are and the type of collective agency that we are. Um, and it's important for us to be able to use the right term for what we are because many of us came into the field because of the term hacker. Um, but once again, a hacker in a way where we weren't doing devious things, we were doing things that out of curiosity. Um, but the reality of it is like sometimes I get this questions like, well, I mean, even the attackers use the term hacker. So why are you guys trying to take the word hacker and use it still? Um, and I always turn around like, well, there's a lot of attackers out there that also use the term, you know, security researcher. When in reality, they're doing malicious activity. So in, in reality, it's, it's important to just know that there's these two parties that exist. And if someone wants to be called a hacker, then we respect that. Just like, you know, when it comes to any other thing, when we claim that we are this, we need to respect that as a community. And do you, do you draw a distinction between the, the word attacker and the word criminal in, in, in terms of how they're used in the press? Um, I do use, so for me, I interchangeably use it. So I'll say um, the attacker did the following things. Um, I will sometimes use the term cyber criminal, um, or I might use the term criminal, just depending on the situation. But an attacker is is someone who's committing a criminal activity, and a criminal activity is someone who's trying to do something for an ill intent. So that's how I see it. So a criminal is someone, for example, that, uh, you know, causes a data breach from a widely used kid's product and puts all that data out there. That's criminal behavior. That's someone who didn't, who saw the vulnerability, didn't report the vulnerability. Instead, they use that vulnerability for their own gain to sell it and to really abuse people's trust. Uh, the, it's interesting because it, what occurs to me is that the, the distinction here is really one of, of whether or not the activity that the the individual is undertaking is is a crime. If they cross that line, they're then a criminal or an attacker, and that that's an important distinction for for people to understand. It's like um, we like to use this and now um, this basically this other way of looking at it. I guess one could say um, is that a locksmith versus a burglar, right? A burglar is going to use the same skills as a locksmith. It's just the locksmith's there to protect you from that attacker or that burglar. That's basically the same thing. Is using the same same skill set, but for different goals. And uh, of course, a, a person could be both, depending on the activity they're carrying out at a given time. Yep, I feel like yeah. it's a lot about when we. It's important to note that because 
there are people that wear, I guess, quote unquote, gray hats, um, but it depends on the situation, the background of the situation. Um, but I think the ones that, you know, Hacking is Not a Crime, which is the organization that I co-founded, we're trying to work with those that feel guilty. In a sense, when people feel guilty that they did something wrong, those are people you want to work with because those are people that they feel that. There are attackers out there that don't feel guilty for what they do. Those are people that I don't know if we'll ever be able to work with. I want the people that, um, in a sense, that experience insomnia or concern when they report a vulnerability, that are concerned that they did something wrong. I want people like that because those are people that have morals. I think, I mean, that brings up an interesting point to me about how, if if the determining factor is whether or not the individual is engaged in committing a crime, then then you have to tie that back to what's considered criminal under the law at a given time. Because I, I know that there that there are some issues around, uh, you know, appropriate protections for what many people would consider security research, but some people would consider criminal acts that sort of cross this line um, or cross the threshold for you in terms of, um, you know, what where, what you advocate for. So it, this seems like a, an interesting issue. What do you do or how do you address the activities that you would consider not criminal but are currently criminalized? So to be honest, um, there is a law that's out there called the CFA, the Computer Fraud Abuse Act, which was passed in 1984. Um, but when it was created, um, interesting story of background here was uh, Ronald Reagan, he watched the movie called War Games, and he panicked. He panicked. He was thinking hackers are devious people. But the thing to remember is that whenever we have legislation that doesn't have proper representation of all parties that it would impact, then we're making a terrible, terrible mistake. Because the CFA, even though it had good intentions, the problem is that it prevents good hacking the same way that it prevents bad hacking. And we need good hacking um, to remain safe, for organizations to be safe, for governments to be safe as well. Um, and that that's the one thing is to keep in mind is that the CFA, when used um, to prosecute when a person um, goes out of scope and exploits it um, or even does extortion, um, that's a criminal activity. The, the thing is, though, is that a lot of times the CFA is being used by private companies and also local government agencies to prosecute hackers that were doing things in good faith. In other words, trying to report a vulnerability and what happens is that it's misinterpreted as someone who's trying to attack them or in other words, they just want to just make the person quiet because they see it as a PR situation. Yeah, they feel like silencing that individual is is going to make the vulnerability not exist for some reason. Exactly. And this is this is the problem, right? Because the issue is that we are missing bilateral trust. Bilateral trust between the hacker community and organizations when it comes to reporting vulnerabilities. And that is a huge situation because... You know, one out of four um, hackers will not report a vulnerability because they're afraid of being prosecuted or having companies get them lawsuits. That's a really interesting statistic. I I'm fascinated by that because, you know, I feel like this is an area where we've seen a lot of progress in the last, I don't know, 10 years even, where organizations that are much more willing to, uh, you know, accept reported vulnerabilities, many of them. It, from my perspective, at least, many of them seem to have actual programs uh, and processes for uh, accepting reported vulnerabilities. Bug bounties are are something that exists now. Uh, but it sounds like you're saying there really hasn't been, or there's a lot of more room for progress there beyond what, what I see. A lot, because right now the Forbes Global 2000 list, um, only, <laughs> this is the worst statistic of it all, is that 94% of them don't have any vulnerability disclosure policies. So that's already letting you know that these are companies that aren't trying to build a bilateral trust amongst the hacker community. Um, these are also companies that if I were to report a vulnerability and I'm not in all in good faith and not wanting to exploit or anything like that, I could land myself with a lawsuit from them. That That's something to think about is that how, when you, I'll just put in this other context, 
Wouldn't you rather find out from someone with good intent about a vulnerability that they should work on versus an attacker finding that vulnerability, not reporting it, and then using it for their own gain? I mean, when you have a breach, you lose customers, trust. You also, not only that, you can lose your product. And I've seen startups, very beginning startups, where they, they have to close down because of a breach. So it's important to understand is that the hacker community are your friends. They are the everyday heroes behind scenes. Um, but by not having a disclosure policy, you're setting yourself up for a failure and a potential breach. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So for these organizations that that see hackers as criminals, as potential criminals who you know, don't really believe that a, a vulnerability disclosure policy is is in their best interest. Uh, how do they end up? How do you educate them to to draw that distinction between someone reporting a security vulnerability uh, and someone who's actually you know intending has criminal intent? Yeah. Um, well, the one thing is that those that don't want to do it um, is because they don't know that there's a difference of the parties, right? So I think that's one of the things. And we see this also in security, by the way, is that still people aren't aware of the hacker community. And that's a huge, that's a huge issue right there. But there are CISOs out there that are trying to push for disclosure policies and whatnot, but their board rejects it because they're worried that that's going to grab more attention for the attackers to find vulnerabilities. Um, and exploit it. But the thing they don't understand is that every time a hacker goes to a website, there's a chance that they're looking for vulnerabilities. And the same when it comes to attackers. Either you not put a program up, you know, it's it's worse for you because you're not letting people know what is okay, what is not okay. And it's better to say up front, this is okay, this is not okay, this is how you communicate it. This is why you don't go publish these things right when you submit the vulnerabilities. Having an outline to let people know what are the rules of engagement is something that is very much needed because think of the PR that gets around when someone finds a vulnerability and then shares it to the world, right? So there's a lot of reasons why it's so important is to invest in disclosure policies because it protects you as a company, but it also builds that bilateral trust so then you can prevent attackers from taking a hold of vulnerabilities and running with them. That's interesting. I mean, it, that means as an organization, having that policy gives you a chance to, to draw those those guidelines so that you can you have a better ability to handle anything that falls outside of those guidelines more more cleanly, more effectively, and, and then ultimately more securely. Exactly. And that's that's the whole thing I think that companies are forgetting or they just don't know. And to be honest, it's most of the time they just don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's a room. It's an area where where advocacy can make a difference. I think definitely. So I want to switch topics a little bit because we've talked a, a lot about the the or we've mentioned the hacker community, but we haven't really talked about what that community looks like, what that means. It, when you talk about the hacker community, what are you really talking about? Why is that a term that that's important to you? Um. So the hacker community um, within Infosec are the ones that are behind the scenes, making sure that you're secure. Um, they're the ones that are, and I always use this phrase everyday heroes because they really are because they protect, you know, you, me, everyone we love, um, to making sure that their data is safe, but they're also people that are fighting for privacy rights at the same time. I think the thing is that the hacker community has been, it's one of those things that everyone kind of wants to know a little bit, like, what is the hacker community? What do we look like? And unfortunately, a lot of the times the images is like, oh, a white cis male, um, usually in their uh, teenage years or early 20s. And that's not the reality. The reality is that we come in all shapes, sizes, everything. 
We're, we're a diverse group of folks from all walks of life all around the world. Um, and we're all connected online uh, because we are all curious individuals, but using that curiosity to protect and to serve. But I mean, you mentioned that as a as a group, it's a diverse group. But I I, I think um, one of the challenges in information security broadly, and I'm 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 going to to assume and allow you to to confirm perhaps that it's also a challenge in the hacker community as a subsegment of of broader infosec. Is, is a lack of diversity. Is that is that a problem there as well? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that problem is in almost every single industry. Um, I would say in the broad view of it, I would say in InfoSec in general has definitely have been dealing with some serious um, diversity inclusion issues. And it's a, I mean, diversity inclusion is an issue that's, you know, top of mind for a lot of organizations these days, um, you know, based on on recent, you know, public events. Uh, but you, prior to some of those very public events, like the death of, of George Floyd as an example, um, you had co-founded a couple of organizations um, focusing on diversity in, in the security space specifically. Yep, this is true. Um, back in 2018, I co-founded a organization called Women of Security, WOSEC. Um, and also, I think about, I want to say like eight, nine months later, I also created a group called Women Hackers at the time, but now it's called We Are Hackers mm-hmm. um, because 4% of the hackers around the world identify as women. Um, and so that in itself lets you know we have a problem. So <laughs> Yeah, 4, 4% is not a lot. Not a lot at all. Um, so we are hackers kind of was formed because I wanted to challenge that statistic because I know that they were women all around the world, non-binary as well, that, um, that it's hard. It's hard because a lot of these forms um, for bug bounty or uh, and hacking and whatnot, the thing is, is that it's, it's a lot of men, a lot of men. And it can become kind of an issue because some of them don't know what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Some actually do know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And it puts you in a situation where you'll uh, take a male's alias name and you'll use a male photo just to avoid these type of conflicts and situations from occurring. So We Are Hackers was a way to create an online community for um, basically marginalized genders all around the world to be able to hack together at all levels. So we have workshops, we have um, like support groups, we have job opportunities. It's a, it's a free free network basically for those that want to be part of a community and feel welcomed. So for people who are interested, you mentioned two organizations, Women of Security and We Are Hackers. What What's the difference between the two? Why would one person, someone be interested in one versus the other? Right. So WOSAC is basically, it's for women and non-binary. Um, and we have chapters all over the world, but it's more based on your community where you live. Um, so pre-COVID-19, basically the chapters would meet monthly in person um, and so getting to know people in their own community, but at the same time being able to network and be there for one another and to thrive in security. And this could be people that came into security recently, been in security for a while, or are interested in security. It's a good way to network to kind of see what's out there. Um, it should say that WOSEC is more geared towards anyone in security. So you could be someone in sales, you could be someone in operations, marketing, but you have to be within security or wanting to join security in a sense. Um, and We Are Hackers is more geared to those that are on the technical side. Um, so those that are hacking at all levels or wanting to get into hacking in general. Okay, that makes perfect sense. That's clear. So I, I think, you know, you and I have both seen, um, you know, a, a number of companies making diversity pledges, talking about how they want to increase diversity. Um, it's something that's, that's uh, you know, certainly been present in the media. And I, I always am interested in, in what concrete steps organizations can take along these lines. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas about what concrete steps organizations can take. And then are there recommendations that are specific to our industry, to the information security industry that makes sense? Yeah. Um, let's first start with the first part. Um, if you're on a board or your company has a board, 
which they should, uh, <laughs> is to look at the board and see how many women are on that board. Let's start there. Um, the thing is, is that representation at the top does trickle down, and I hate using that term trickle down because I think of Reagan economics. Um, but the thing is, uh, trickle down is basically the effect that someone's at the top to represent you and gives you, a person like you, a voice. And that's what's missing, is that when you look at boards and security, you'll see that it's pretty much all white men. And the problem with that is that what happens to everyone else who is not a white cis man? Their voice is not being heard. That means policies, um, work culture is not going to be reflected. So that's why it's important is to make sure you have a diverse board, a diverse C-level board as well, um, to make sure that you're able to be make the most welcoming environment for all people when they walk in that office. The other thing you can also take a note of when it looks at managers. So most of the time, and this is more of a gender situation, is that when it comes to people being managers is that you'll see that for women in particular, it's really hard to go beyond a manager title. Um, because it's hard for them to go beyond a manager title, you'll see that it's pretty much all above manager titles are men. That's an issue right there. That's already letting you know you have a problem. Um, so it's important is to show that type in a reflection of 50-50. You should see equal amounts of men and women um, and also those that are non-binary as well to have these manager titles beyond. Um, those are things that they can do immediately on that front um, is, is to change their numbers in-house. Um, but also to remember that those that are underrepresented folks at your company, please don't use them as marketing collateral. We see that quite a bit. Or going to them for advice. If you're going to do that, pay them for it. Um, I would say on that front. Well, that, that's actually a really interesting point um, because I, I I think it it always worries me when when you know an organization looks to their underrepresented groups to do the work to improve representation, but at the same time, if you if you have a an organization that lacks diversity, it makes perfect sense to lean on the people who are there who might um, you know be representative of of those underrepresented groups for their opinions. The idea of paying them for that time is a really interesting one because it compensates them for the work. So it's not them doing the work as a volunteer, but it still gets you the benefit of their 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 perspective in a situation where they have a, a uniquely valuable perspective. Yeah, and it's important to understand is the reason you should be paying them is for the extra work, but also because usually those that are underrepresented tend to take on other jobs at their work and not get paid for it. And this is one of the reasons why it's harder for them to climb that ladder is because suddenly they're this and this and that as well. Um, and that's a, that's a horrible situation, but that's usually what happens. Um, so it's important is to recognize that. So let's talk about the security space specifically, because I, you know, I think the recommendations that you've talked about so far apply generally uh, you know, across the board to just about any type of organization. Are there things that we in security should be doing specifically um, around diversity? Stop gatekeeping. <laughs> Let's talk about what gate, gatekeeping means. Yeah. Um, so gatekeeping is basically the, uh, we could just start very simple. Um, when HR receives your resume, that they look at your name and look at other names and then be like, we're not going with this person because of their name, because there's human biases that exist. That's one way of gatekeeping is that the other ways of gatekeeping is saying, this person must have this number of certs, this cert in particular, and this years of experience. If they don't, we don't even look at them. That's another problem because the reality of it is that a lot of people can't afford those certs. And because they can't afford that, it doesn't allow them to have that position. But I have to admit, research has shown over and over and over again that you don't need certs nor years of experience to prove that you have that ability to do that job. It's whether or not you have the skills to do that job. And in particular in security, certs, degrees, those, those don't mean anything because the reality is how many attackers have certs? How many of them have years of experience before they took on the role of being an attacker? Honestly, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's whether or not they have the ability to do it. 
So it's really important is to utilize tools and resources to test them ahead of the time and remove the names from the, the resumes so you have a really clear view of the person who's applying and seeing if they have the ability to do the job because that's all you're looking for is someone who's going to be a good team player, someone who's driven um, to do better, and also someone who can do the job that they're set out to apply to do. So that's that's interesting because I think there are two sides to that recommendation. Uh, one is that on the on the employer's side is what you've said to you know look at your process, take you know the example of of a a great candidate who has an alternative path to their job and make sure that you would actually hire that person if they came through your your pipeline. Um, I think in security that that resonates really well because this is an industry where you know people come to this industry through all different kinds of 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 paths. It's just, it's a reality. But the flip side of that is that if you're an underrepresented, if you're a member of an underrepresented group, um, I, I've heard the advice, I've heard n- many people say certs don't matter in security. Yeah. But it, it feels to me like if you're an underrepresented group, you, you have to acknowledge that that in the hiring process, they, they probably do matter. And so I wouldn't, I, I'd ask you, would you encourage people on the employee side of it, not the employer side, to pursue those certifications as part of their their career or not? I think if you are starting out in this industry, it's very hard to get into it. I know as a um, someone who's trying to be a pen tester, it could take up to two years to get a position. So CERTs allow you to kind of like open that door a little bit for you to even be part of that interview process if you have um, a lack of years of experience that they want. Um, I think that's definitely one of the things is to take into consideration. But honestly, at the end of the day, um, we need to do better in security when it comes to certs is that if people can't afford it, that shouldn't be the thing that keeps them out. We are dealing with a huge personnel shortage in security, and we need to fix that. There's plenty of people out there that want to get hired but yet we are gatekeeping them from having positions. And sometimes when we put positions out there uh, for entry level, they're not entry level because they're still requiring three to five years of experience, and but they wanna pay you low. Um, so I think what we need to do is come together and you know separate little sectors within InfoSec in general is to work on that, making it more accessible because we need to be more accessible in order to fix our personnel shortage, also to make sure that people are getting hired, that we're not practicing any discrimination practices. Because the thing is, if a cert costs a couple thousand dollars, chances are that person's not gonna be able to get one. Um, And I think that's a huge problem right there, is that we need to find ways to make sure that those people can get those certs where it's affordable for them, um, because we want them. We want these people. Every, Every company wants, new people and security. They want people that are driven, caring, have empathy, um, but we're not gonna get diverse nor inclusion if we keep practicing the same stuff that we're doing right now. Chloe, I feel like we could continue this conversation for a lot longer, but uh, we've, we've kind of come to the end of our, our time. Um, I wanna thank you. I think it was really interesting um, and I, I hopefully an educational conversation for, for all of the listeners as well. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. This was fun. And thanks to everyone who listened. Um, I hope it was interesting and enjoyable and that you tune in for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.